Mary, an inspired word. Then said some of the jury, uh, some of them at Jerusalem, Is not this he whom you seek to kill? But lo, he speaks boldly, and they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is now the very Christ? How be it, verse 27, we know uh, where this man uh, has come from uh, and who he is. No man knows uh, from where he is. Verse 28. Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, You both know me, and you know where I am, and you know, and, and I am not come of myself. But he that sent me is true, whom you do not know. But I know him, verse 29, for I am from him, and he has sent me. Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him, because his hour was not yet come. And many of the people believed on him, and said, When Christ comes, will he do more miracles than these which this man has done? And the Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things concerning him. And the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him, and then said Jesus to them, Yet a little while I am with you, and then I go to him that sent me. You shall seek me, and you shall not find me. And where I am, there you cannot come. Then said the Jews among themselves, Where will he go that we shall not find him? Will he go to the dispersed among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? What manner of saying is this? That he said, you shall seek me and shall not find me. And where I am, there you cannot come. This is reiterated by John twice in this passage. Uh, and it is incredibly important in the context of this verse. Now, remembering in the lead up to this, we need some context. Last week, uh, we looked at Jesus who went up to Jerusalem. It's the Feast of the Tabernacles, right, everyone? He's gone up to Jerusalem in the timing of God. He didn't go up with his family. He went up in the timing of God a, a few days later uh, on God's divine schedule. And he entered into the temple. In the middle of the week, he shows up at the Feast of Tabernacles. The temple is filled with people. Uh, the rabbinical teachers teaching all around the temple in the outer court. And Jesus shows up in the middle of the week. They're expecting him, but have almost given up chance that he's going to show up. And he catches them. That is, our Lord catches them off guard. And Jesus begins to teach in the temple, in the outer court. And the people are marveling at his teaching. What are they marveling at? Well, they're marveling at the fact that he's teaching with authority, not like the scribes and the Pharisees have. He's teaching teachings that are light years beyond uh, the teachings of the rabbinical laws and one uh, the things are handed down from one um, teacher to another or one Pharisee to another, one rabbinical leader to another. The Pharisees know they can't attack Jesus' teaching because it's beyond reproof. You can't attack any teaching or put a uh, poke a hole in Jesus' teaching. So they add or they basically attack his person, his character. And uh, they basically attack the person of Christ and say, well, you know, we know this guy's parents. We know where this guy's from. We know this guy hasn't had any teaching in our rabbinical institutes and in our schools of theology. Why would you be listening to him? So it's an attack on the person of Christ, not on his teaching. Now, that's what the Pharisees are saying. But other people are saying, well, this guy's going crazy. People think that they're trying to kill him. And, of course, they were out of the know because the Jews were trying to kill him. Uh, and they claim that Jesus, do you remember? They claim that Jesus had a, a demon. Now, this is dangerous ground to find yourself on when you're calling the Son of God a demon possessed. So the people are confused. They're under the control of the people, uh, of the Pharisees and the re re apostate religious system. Uh, and we're going to see in the book of John that Jesus is only going to go on to face more and more opposition. If we look in chapter 7, verse 1. We can see that the Jews were already seeking an opportunity to kill our Lord. In verse 19 of chapter 7, uh, we see that uh, the question is asked, why do you go about to kill me? And so we know that this is on their agenda. And verse 25, we see again, and this will be a, the first verse of our text, um, that the people are saying, isn't this the man that they're trying to kill? 
Now, in John's account, uh, we in John's book, everyone, we're in the last. We're just entering into the last six months of Jesus' life. So, although we're only in verse uh, chapter seven, we're in the last six months of Jesus' life. So, where's John's focus? John's focus for the next what? I don't know, thirteen something chapters. 13, 14 chapters are going to be on the last days of Jesus. The prayer in the garden, the great high priestly prayer, the last supper, the agonies of Christ in the garden, uh, all of the lead up to what he teaches the disciples and spends time with the disciples. We're going to get an inside route, an inside look at how our Lord speaks to his disciples, unlike Matthew, Mark and Luke. And so uh, we're going to be looking very much at the internal life of Jesus, the emotional, the uh, relational side of Jesus' life. And uh, this isn't the only thing uh, as far as opposition that we've seen in the life of Jesus. Yes, the Jews are trying to plot his death already and trying to take him out prematurely, which is why Jesus has to go up to Jerusalem secretly. We see that the majority of his disciples have what? Already left him. Two and a half years of public ministry, last six months. In the last six months, pretty much nobody's following him. A small group of people, some of his family, some of his key disciples. So in John 6, 66, the majority of disciples leave him. Many of the disciples left him. I mean, if Jesus was the pastor of a local church, most people left to the church would be going, Jesus, you're doing things all wrong here, okay? You're failing at growing a church, all right? You're just simply failing. You're not doing it right. Even his own brothers have to say... Jesus, you've got to work on this. You've got to get back to Jerusalem. You've got to start doing some miracles. You've got to start building up your church again. Start building up your following again. Not only that, but his own brothers don't what? Believe in him. So his own family, who he's grown up with, don't believe in him. Uh, and it just simply looks from an outer perspective that uh, Jesus is going to be struggling to be this triumphant, uh, conquering Messiah in Christ that... He says that he is. In this passage, we're going to break it out into three different sections. We're going to see, uh, we've got this up on the screen here, verses 25 through 29. We're going to see the people's opinion. Uh, and, and we see this in modern day uh, Christianity. Everyone's got an opinion about Jesus. Uh, and, and there's always a mixed opinion about Jesus, the people's opinion. Then we're going to see in verses 30 through 32, the ruler's rejection. Um, the ruler's rejection, that is the Pharisees or the religious leaders' rejection. So general, the general public aren't buying into Jesus. The religious people aren't buying into Jesus. And Jesus will respond with some pretty solid, uh, powerful preaching on how this will cause them to be excluded from the kingdom in verses 33 through 36. And I want to spend most of my time in that last section because there are, apart from it being a, an historical narrative, uh, there is going to be just some really good high points in this sermon that I, I want to launch into before we get to our Lord's table. So I've got a good 40 minutes to get through this as well as celebrate our Lord's table in the last 10 minutes or so. So let's get into our passage this morning. Verse 25. Then some of the residents of Jerusalem began to say, isn't this the man that they're trying to kill? Now, John is recording for us that some of the people in Jerusalem, that they're starting to cotton on. Now, this is not um, contradicting John 6.19, where some of the public or some of the, the punters, if you like, or the general people in the temple were saying, Jesus is demon-possessed because he thinks people are trying to kill him, but we can't see people trying to kill him. But there are a group now, so this isn't contradicting, this is John's building on the narrative, that there are people that are starting to become aware that there is a plot to kill Jesus. And so some of the residents, local residents in Jerusalem, John says, uh, that are familiar with what goes on, are realising that there is a plot here to kill this man, Jesus. All right? They're not believing in him at this point. Uh, they're plotting. They're trying to kill Jesus. Uh, and verse 26 goes on uh, and builds on this. They not only make the comment, well, they're trying to kill Jesus, but they're trying to kill Jesus, but they're not doing a good job about it because Jesus is still in the temple, he, yet he is here, he's speaking publicly, and they're saying nothing to him. Do the rulers really know that this man is, let me add in or insert the word now, the Christ, have they changed their mind? 
So let's get an idea of what's happening here. Jesus is teaching, but he's teaching publicly. And many are hearing him in the temple. We're going to sort of add some visual here to this. But the, the word here is in the King James is he's speaking boldly. Now, the word boldly in the Greek literally is parisi, which means with freedom, openness and boldness of speech. It looks like to the punter and to the religious people that he's given free liberty to say whatever he wants. In essence, Jesus is not holding back. He is preaching whatever he wants, however he wants, and he's gathering a bigger crowd. By this time, you can almost imagine that the majority of people are hearing him and seeing him and gathering around him. Uh, and hearing these words from our Lord, this great teaching that is just simply outclassing everything else that every other person in the temple has heard before. And the people are asking themselves in verse 26, if this is the guy the Pharisees are plotting to kill, uh, they're not doing a good job about keeping him quiet, (laughs) about keeping him out of the temple. Here he is. Uh, Look at the line, verse 26, yet here he is. Preaching to us about the great truths, about the kingdom, sin, judgment, righteousness, heaven and hell, election and reprobation. And we're about to hear Jesus' little snippet of a sermon that John records for us that he taught on. And Jesus is not holding back in his preaching, I can promise you that. And the religious leaders are seemingly standing back doing nothing. And the people are asking themselves, well, why don't they stop him? We thought they wanted him dead. Or do they actually now entertain the fact that he is the Messiah. They're, they're giving him so much latitude here in his preaching and teaching in the temple. But we, we're going to find out here that this is not because the Pharisees weren't mad and didn't want to get him. This is because the divine hand of God is restraining the response so that Christ can do all he needs to do. All right? So we're going to see that uh, in the story. Verse 27. But we know where this man comes from. Whenever the Christ comes, no one will know where he comes from. Now, this is the response of the public slash Jewish people, the Pharisees. And they conclude, no, this man uh, is from Nazareth. We know his family. We know his town. He can't possibly be the Messiah, the Christ, the one whom the Old Testament speaks about. Uh, In both these assertions, we know where this man comes from. This man couldn't possibly be the Christ. In both their assertions, they want everyone. They're wrong. Now, this is a bit weird because the Pharisees had the ability, the Jews, the rabbis had the ability to know out exactly where Jesus was born. We know our Lord was not born in Nazareth. He doesn't come from Nazareth uh, in the sense that that's where the prophecy said that he was going to be born. Uh, There was a well-known prophecy which the whole nation was familiar with, that Christ would come out of the town of Bethlehem, Micah 5.2, Matthew 2.5, John 7.42. So, yes, Jesus is the Nazarene. Jesus does reign from that region. But where did prophecy say he would be born? They knew where he would come from. He would be born out of Bethlehem, which fulfills the prophecy, which makes him the Christ, the the Messiah, in the line of fulfilling all the things that Jesus would fulfill. Uh, We see, if we go back to John 6.42, the Jews were continually making this an issue. This guy can't be the Christ because we know where he's from. He's from Nazareth. We know his family. We know he's a carpenter. They're trying to do this to underwrite uh, the person of Christ. They're trying to attack where he's from. It's an ad hominem argument, right, everyone? And in 6.42, the Jews are grumbling about him. Is not uh, this Jesus the son of Joseph? whose father and mother we know, uh, how does he now say, I've come down out of heaven? John 7, 41. Some were saying, this is the Messiah. Still others were saying, well, the Messiah is not going to come from Galilee, is he? Peter says of the... And look, the Jews could have searched the temple records and worked out exactly, because Jesus was dedicated in the temple, that he was from and born uh, in Bethlehem. But they didn't do that. The ignorance is astounding here. Uh, And one would imagine that they are being willingly ignorant. They don't want Jesus to be the Christ. They don't want to necessarily go search the records or check uh, what's going on. Um, They should have known by his words, by his works, and by uh, even the historical 
uh, scenarios that the Lord was who he said he was, but they didn't want to believe that. Second Peter 3, 5, Peter basically talks of people who are willingly ignorant. Not only are they just unknowingly ignorant, everyone, they are willingly ignorant. This has not changed today about Christianity. People shut their eyes to the plainest truths about Christianity, right, everyone? Well, there can't be a God. Look at the world around you. There can't be a God. No, look at the world around you. There is a God. It's plain. It's obvious. Natural revelation uh, tells us the way nature is, intelligent design that there is a God, but they pretend that they do not understand and therefore cannot believe. And ignorance simply is no excuse, not in a court of law and certainly not in the court of God's law in the final judgment where you say, well, Lord, you just didn't give me enough proof. There's enough proof. And thus goes the old proverb, there is none so blind as those who will not see. There's that willingness there, that willingly ignorant of 2 Peter 3, 5. Well, the Jews aren't buying into this. We know this man. We know where he's from. Uh, he is simply not uh, the Christ. He is not the Messiah. And the people are saying, well, hang on a minute. Uh, when the Christ comes, is he going to do more works than this guy? I mean, Jesus has pulled out every miracle that we could possibly think of. He's teaching like we've never seen. He is apparently who he might be. And so they're really struggling uh, of course, they're under the fear and the domination of the Jews as well at this point. And in verse 28 and 29, we get to where I want to really uh, land uh, this morning. And we've got, we got time to really kind of tease this out. But Jesus, verse 28, then Jesus. So it was like John's inserting this in. Let's turn the camera back on Jesus now. All right, forget the people. Forget the Jewish rulers. Let's turn the camera on Jesus. Then Jesus, while teaching in the temple court. So he's already teaching. But Jesus is going to lift this sermon to a whole new level here. He what, everyone? He cries out. You both know me and you know where I've come from. So Jesus knows what they're saying. He, the Lord Jesus, who knows all things, knows all that happens in the heart and the minds of all men because he's God in flesh, addresses their internal questioning, their murmuring, their complaining, their doubting. And he says, you know me. You both know me, speaking of both the public, the general public and the religious rulers, you both. You both know me and you know where I've come from. And I have not come of my own initiative, but the one who sent me is true. You do not know him, but I know him. And because I have come from him and he sent me. Now, this is only the first half of the sermon here that John gives us. Uh, but John is certainly giving us enough to work from in the teaching of what our Lord was getting at. So Jesus is teaching already and knowing what's going on, he lifts his preaching to a whole new level. He's already preaching in that sort of didactic ability that our Lord obviously did. And uh, John records that he now cries out. This is kradzo, uh, literally to cry aloud, to shriek with deep emotion. Listen to me. This word is used uh, a number of times in the New Testament. It's used from everyone who would cry out for a miracle. Lord Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. It's used of the demon-possessed man who cried out in agony. Descriptive of the shriek that came from the graveyard as this man was being tormented by this demon. Crying out in the agony of being demon-possessed. There is only one word stronger than this, John MacArthur says, that is used of Jesus, and that is his cry on the cross of Calvary. So much for Jesus, meek and mild. For those who prefer the calm teaching of the Scriptures, we look this morning, brethren, I mean, Jesus is thundering out in the temple this emotive, uh, driving message that's going to be about heaven and hell, about those who are saved and not saved and where they go. And it's going to be a monster message. And, you know, this whole notion that Jesus was very calm. Yes, he was. When he taught parables, when he taught stories and he wanted to 
sort of work an angle on something. He would talk conversationally and the common people heard him gladly, right? But then there was a time when Jesus preached and was like, get out of the way. This guy is commanding everyone's attention. Our Lord is simply thundering a message home because it has eternal consequences. Why is he crying? Why is he lifting up his voice? Because he's, he's using the appropriate tone and intonation and gravitas and pathos that it needs to actually get the people's attention. So sure, he's been teaching on sin and judgment and righteousness. We've already seen some of the things that our Lord's been teaching on. But now he's thundering against those who deny him and will not believe on him. And he wants them to know what will be the result of their unbelief. You want to play the religious system? You want to just be an observer? A general public and know something about me? Know where I'm from naturally? Think you know about me? Think you know my parents? You will not get to heaven because you know these things. You will only get to heaven because you believe on me and that the Father sent me and that I am who I say that I am. I mean, this is really important stuff because Jesus is in his Father's house teaching the truths of the gospel. And if people don't get this, they go to hell. So it's all on the line. Jesus at the same time is exposing empty Jewish apostate religion. He's exposing the general public's wanting to sort of straddle the fence. I'm not committed to the Jewish system. I'm not committed to Jesus. I'll just see where I land. And Jesus is going to say to them, you both know me and you both know where I'm from and you'll be without excuse on the great day. So have I got your attention? Because I'm sure that Lord Jesus had their attention uh, in the temple as he's preaching. Uh, Jesus shifts into top gear. Naturally, he tells them, you know where I'm from. But spiritually, he tells them, you think you know me. Can you see it there? You both know me and you know where I'm from. But you don't know me. You don't know where I've come from. And I know this because I know that you don't know who sent me. You don't know my father. In John 8, 19, he says, you neither know me nor my father. You cannot honour the Son without honouring the Father. You do not believe on the Son if you do not believe the Father sent Him. He's saying, you think that you know my earthly family, that you know me, but you don't. To know me is to know me not as Jesus of Nazareth, but to know me as the Messiah, the Christ, the one that the Old Testament speaks of, the one that the Father has sent. You're looking for something more, a triumphant Messiah, a conquering King. And Jesus says, I've not come of my own initiative. You see that line in there? I've not come of my own initiative. Friends, a true preacher is sent from God. John the Baptist came out of the wilderness and he was sent and appointed by God to preach. All God-ordained preachers are sent by God. This is why you know, we hear people like Charles Spurgeon teaching the people in his college back in the day, if you can do anything else, do anything else apart from become a preacher and a pastor because it has to be a God thing for you. And he says, I've come not on my own initiative. I'm not self-sent or self-appointed, our Lord says. And this is what the Pharisees were, weren't they? They were man-appointed. They were self-appointed. They were self-titled. They gave themselves titles and gave themselves honorific sort of um, name tags. And this is what the Lord's pushing against. Jesus tells them in verse 28, You think you know me, but you don't know me. You've got information about me, but you don't know me spiritually. You don't know me savingly. You know Jesus as a historical figure. You know me uh, as someone that has done some miracles. Um, but friends, this is proof that you can know or have some knowledge about Jesus, but still not be saved. He's basically telling these people that they're not saved yet. They know a bit about him and that knowledge is enough to sort of almost trip them up. Verse 30. So then they, watch this, they then tried to seize Jesus. But no one laid a hand on him because his time had not yet come. Wow. Now if this verse isn't underlined in your Bible, it's a great comfort to the believer. Why? Well, from a human viewpoint, they literally tried to get him. In their minds, they're thinking, let's get this guy. Let's just pounce on him now because they would do this to anybody that did blasphemy in the temple. Just grab them. And, you know. So yeah, there's no reason why they shouldn't. This is why they had the temple police. You could just grab people and chuck them out if you weren't happy with them. And this isn't the first time that Jesus has avoided premature death here. 
even in his hometown. Don't know whether you know this or are aware of this, but in his hometown, when he preached for the first time, they literally dragged him out of the church to the edge of the cliff and tried to throw him over the edge. So this is the first time Jesus just walked straight through them. So John tells us it was for a divine reason because Jesus is on a divine schedule. They couldn't touch him. They wanted to get him. They tried to get him, John says, but they couldn't. Jesus was on a divine schedule. How does John write it? His time had not yet come. What was Jesus' time? Jesus' time was on the cross. His time had not yet come. Yet we can see from a divine viewpoint, they were restrained by the invisible hand of God. This speaks to God being in control of all events at all times and all places. This is what all the earth spins around and every event happens for. For the glory of God, for the plan of God, for the purpose of God. Philippians chapter 2 verse 3 is a great verse to remind us that everything is for His plan, for His good pleasure, for His purpose. Philippians 2 3, uh, 13, sorry. One author says, uh, They thirsted for Christ's blood, they were determined to kill Him. Yet by invisible restraint from above, they were powerless to do anything. Not a hair of his head could be touched without divine permission because God is in control of absolutely everything. Up on the screen, we've got a a quote from J.C. Ra, which I think is uh, really helpful when we look at the principles behind this verse. Because I, I think this is something that's not only linked to Jesus, but linked to our Christian life as well. He says this verse shows us plainly that all our Lord's sufferings were undergone voluntarily. He wasn't put through anything that was under the duress of someone else. He chose to follow the Father's will and enter into suffering when the Father determined it and decreed it. And so of his own free will. He did not, J.C. Ryle says, go to the cross because he could not help it. He did not die because he could not prevent his death. Neither Jew nor Gentile, Pharisee or Sadducee, Annas or Caiaphas, Herod or Pontius Pilate could have injured our Lord except power had been given to them from where? From God. All that they did was done under control and by permission by the invisible hand of God. He goes on and uses the example of the crucifixion was a part of the eternal counsels of the Trinity. The sufferings and death of our Lord could not begin until the very hour which Christ had, uh, God had appointed. So with this principle in mind, A.W. Pink says, not a hair of our heads could be touched without God's permission. You should be feeling safe this morning. Nothing can happen to you unless God has allowed it. And if something happens to you, what are we going to decide? God's allowed it for some reason. He's disciplining me. He's teaching me. He's correcting me. He's uh, putting a hedge around me. Even with Job, we know that there was a hedge around Job. God nor Satan doesn't deny that fact. God doesn't deny it. When Satan says, you put a hedge around him. God's not denying that. But A.W. Pink goes on. He says, the demon-possessed soul might hurl a javelin at David, but hurling it and killing him are two different things. God allowed the hurling, but not the killing. You see that? Daniel might be cast into a den of lions, but at his time to die had not yet come. Their mouths were mysteriously sealed. Much to the chagrin of those who threw him in there, I'm sure. The three Hebrews were cast into that fiery furnace. But of what avail were the flames against the one who protected them, the great and mighty Jehovah? Friends, if lions can't eat you, if flames can't burn you, if spears can't javelin you, I said that wrong, but you know what I'm saying, don't you? You should trust that God has a time for all of us. Uh, And he has allowed certain things to come to us and nobody can touch us unless the Lord appoints it. In relation to us, this principle should be of great comfort. Nothing can hurt God's people except and until God permits it. So then, a little quote from J.C. Ryle, we are all immortal until God's done with us. Wow. Wow. This is why they can put John into a vat of boiling oil and he still comes out alive and they can't kill him. And he ends up writing the book of Revelation on Patmos because God hadn't done with him. So we should take great comfort in this, which is why we should really pretty much go hard at it, 
follow the Lord with everything we got. Uh, this is why Paul, I'm sure, turns around and says at the end of it, I've run my race. I know that my time's at hand. I know the Lord's finished with me now. To realise that nothing happens in this world except by the eternal counsels of our Father and according to His eternal plans is one of the grandest secrets, J.C. Ryle says, of living a calm, a peaceful and a contented life. Do you see how that works? If I know that nothing can get to me apart from through the Lord's hand, it allows me to live a calm, a peaceful and a contented life because nothing can get to me unless it's come through God. You've got to get this, guys. Because everything that happens to you, if you don't get this, can feel like I'm just a cork, bobbing in the ocean of ever-ending circumstances and events. And that is not how God's wired your life. Martin Luther said it this way, God has appointed a nice, easy hour for everything. And yet the devil shoots, and he throws at the poor clock hand. But in vain, for all depends on the hour. What hour? Till the hour comes and the hand runs its course, the devil and the world shall accomplish nothing, says Martin Luther. The devil can do all he wants. At the end of the day, God appoints and directs everything. He decrees everything and nothing can get in the way of that. Verse 31 in our text. Yet many of the crowd believed in him and said, whenever the Christ comes, won't he perform more miraculous signs than this man did? At this point, the crowd are beginning to ask, could this actually be the Messiah? I mean, can we expect somebody greater than this? Verse 32, the Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things about Jesus. So the chief priests and the Pharisees, they couldn't do anything, so what do they do? They sent for the officers. We're stuck. We can't do anything. We're going to send for the officers. Now these are like the, the temple bouncers. These are security. Okay, So they're the guys that are going to get Jesus out. And they're powerless to do anything, so uh, they send for these guys. And have a look at uh, chapter 7, verse 30, 45. It's incredible. These temple police come back, and what do they say? They come back to the chief priest saying, and they say, why didn't you bring him? We sent you to arrest him. Why didn't you bring him? And the, answer, the officers answered, you haven't heard this guy speak before. This guy's incredible. Never has a man spoken like this. And what is the Pharisees' response? Have you also been led astray and been deceived by this man? We're going to see later that Nicodemus takes a side for Jesus and they're going to have a go at Nicodemus too. Verse 33, then Jesus said, I will be with you only for a little while longer. So this is now a continuation. John's got the camera back on Jesus. I will be with you only for a little while longer and then I'm going to the one who sent me. Jesus knows that his time is at hand. He knows he's got a few months left, literally, you know, six months and he's going to be offered up uh, as a sacrifice for the sins of his people. He goes, I'm just going to be with you for a little while longer. He's telling them. Uh, he knows. And verse 34, watch this. You will look for me. This is everyone in earshot. You will all look for me. And what? You won't be able to find me. And where I am, you cannot come. Well, what in the world is he talking about here? You'll look for me. You won't find me. Where I go and you can't come. There is a direct reference here. Watch this, to heaven and hell in the preaching of Christ. Where I go, where's Jesus going? He's going to go back to heaven. You cannot go. Where are you going, Jesus is telling them? You're going to go to hell. Where I go, you, you can't come. You will look for me in hell and not find me. I will be in heaven with my Father. I'm going back to him who sent me. You will look for me, but you will not find me. The prophet Jeremiah in Chapter 29, verse 13 says that we must seek him while he may be found. What's the warning? There's a time. There's a clock ticking on this. Seek him while he may be found. Respond while you have life. Proverbs warns us. Then they shall call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. Proverbs 128. Jesus is telling you that where I am, you cannot come. What does he mean? I'm going to my Father. I came down from heaven. I'm going back to heaven. You will never go to heaven. Heaven is not for everybody. Heaven is for those who believe on the Lord Jesus and no one else. You don't. You think you know where I'm from? You deny where I'm from? From my Father? You think you know that the prophecies aren't about me? When if you did your research, you knew that I was born in Bethlehem? 
You know that I'm the Christ and yet you choose to reject me because of your unbelief. You will never go where I'm going. You will seek me and you will never find me. Jesus is teaching here that there are two paths to eternity. A narrow way that feels right to man and ends in death. You die in your sins. and a, a, Sorry, a, a broad way and then a narrow way that leads to him. Jesus is showing us that there are two clear groups of people in the eternal realm. Those who are with Christ and those who are without Christ. Those who are with Christ, and watch this everyone, those who will seek to be with Him, but will not be able to access or find Him who cannot come. Note the direct inference of our Lord and the warning. All in eternity, all in eternity will want to be with Him. But many will not be able to find Him anymore. The opportunity to be saved for them will be what? It's too late. You will seek for me. You will call out for me. And you will not find me. You cannot come to me. The Pharisees and the general public are all given the same warning. This is the general call of the gospel, right everyone? This is the call to all that they may repent who are outside of Christ. Everyone faces the same eternity. Jesus preaches an exclusive gospel. Salvation is through Him and Him alone. No one gets to heaven through the Father but through Him. He cries aloud. The great preaching of salvation. What is he doing? He has lifted up his voice. He is crying out, saying, you think you're saved. You're not saved. There will be a time that you realize at the point of death and entering into hell that you have made the wrong decision and you will seek, you will cry out of the flames and I will not be there. You will want me to save you. You will beg for me to save you. And it's too late. Wow. Wow. I think Jesus was a pretty riveting preacher. Christ alone, he teaches the impossibility of the unconverted and the unbelieving men of going to heaven. Jesus is teaching it right here. It's a place where they simply cannot come. Note, and I want you to not miss this because this is critical in the text of Jesus' divinity. Jesus tells them in present tense timing, you cannot come where I am. You cannot come where I am. As God, we're just going to go a little deeper into the pool here, everyone. But as God, you need to know that Jesus took on a fleshly body, but he still was in heaven as God. He never left heaven as God. And that's why he's saying here, you cannot come where I am. He is there right now in present tense. Turn with me to John 3. Let's just go back because some of you are going, what, what, what's going on? John 3, verse 13. Jesus tells them in verse 12, If I have told you of earthly things and you believe not, how should you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? No man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, that is Jesus speaking of his incarnate earthly existence, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. As God, Jesus never ceased to be in heaven, even when he was fulfilling his ministry on earth during his incarnation. As God, he could truly say, everyone, where I am and not merely where I was or where I shall be, where I am. The Son of Man, which is in heaven. No mere man could have claimed this, and this is testament to our Lord's divinity and his divine nature going to move on from that but I just wanted to show you that because I think that's another inference that we can't miss in John that John is actually painting a very dynamic Christology that Jesus has not had to leave the throne to come down the Trinitarian God has always and always will be ruling and reigning in glory Jesus took on our flesh and yes as man and God could be in two places at one time or else we rule out God's omnipresence because Jesus has to be in one place at one time. And that's simply not a divine attribute of the Lord Jesus. Jesus would simply then not be God anymore during his incarnation. Verse 35, Then the Jewish leaders said to one another, Where is he going to go that we cannot find him? He is not going to go to the Jewish people dispersed among the Greeks and teach the Greeks, is he? 
They're simply mocking what Jesus is saying. I go where you cannot come. And the Jews are saying, well, where's he going to go? Is he going to go outside of Jerusalem to the Gentiles, that are, the, the Jews that are dispersed throughout the Gentile region and preach to them? Because the Jews wouldn't go there. They mocked anyone getting the gospel. Even in Acts, right, when the gospel was being preached among Jew and Gentile and all the different cultures around the world, they're mocking that. They don't want that. And then they go on. They ask, what did he mean by saying, you will look for me and you will not find me and where I come, you, where I am, again, there's the inference, where I am, you cannot come. Twice reiterated there by John. Well, friends, sadly, there will be a time when all unbelievers will look for the true Christ and it will be too late. They will ponder the meaning of the message that they heard in the temple uh, and they've died. And friends, we know that Paul says, absent from body, present with the Lord. You're in eternity, straight away. Uh, we see this in the fact that death is final. Uh, he, there is no reversal. Hell is, after all, a truth discovered too late. Jesus makes a penetrating and powerful statement. You will seek me and not find me. Which says that sinners will seek him and not be able to find him. Part of what hell is, friends, is a suffering of sin. Yes, we're suffering for the sins that Christ didn't take and you are having to bear out through eternity. All sin must be paid for in the economy of God. It's paid for by Christ on the cross or it's paid for by you, separated from God. Hell is also resentment. Hell is also unrelieved bitterness without hope. That's why there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. In the tormenting darkness, Jesus says, you will seek me. What a horrible reality. You will not find me. Hell is not where Christ is forgotten. Hell is where Christ is simply unavailable anymore. You will have a memory in heaven and you will have a memory in hell. And you will look back. Think of the, the person right now that's thinking back of all the lost gospel opportunities that they were offered. Where I go, Jesus says, you cannot come. Jesus' way of saying to the Pharisees and those of the people who called him demonized that because of their unbelief they will be shut out of heaven forever, unable to change the circumstances once they've entered into the reality of their eternal life. We've got this notion still out there that, well, God is good and if we're good, God will accept us. But that's simply not what the gospel teaches. We've made mistakes, we've sinned, God is holy and we must make it right with God. This simplistic view of being good through life, doing a good job and loving one another and simply getting into an eternity and God will just wipe away all those things because I'm generally a good guy, simply isn't going to work. Jesus has given the same message to just general person in the temple, religious inquirer, Jewish and apostate Pharisee. He's given the same message to all of them. He's not picked them out because he said you both know where I'm from. You both know who sent me. Matthew 25 warns us of this in the parable of the virgins. If you want to go there, uh, the verse I want you to look at in Matthew 25, 11. And we, of course we know that the, the virgins are representative of people who have a form of religion, right? They look like they're genuine. They've got a little bit of oil. They've got the lamp there in the same place as the true believers. But it's an empty religious system. They run out of oil. They don't know Christ. They look like Christians. They sound like Christians. But when the bridegroom comes, the door was shut on them. They couldn't enter in in verse 11 of 25. And they cried to the Lord, saying, Lord, Lord, open the door to us. And Jesus would not. Friends, it was too late for them. Yes, God is merciful. Amen, everyone? But there is an end to his mercy. When your last day comes, you take your final breath. You're either saved and going to be where the Lord is, or you're not. Let's go forward in John 7 to John 8, and let's see that our Lord pleads with them again in John 8, verses 21 through 25. But then said Jesus again to them, again to them, I go my way, and you shall seek me, and you shall die in your sins, and where I go you cannot come. Then said the Jews, will he kill himself? How bad are these guys? You know what they're thinking? Well, Jesus... Kill himself. Will he commit suicide? He'll go to hell and he won't go to be where we are in heaven. That's how bad they are. This is tragic. 
Will he kill himself because he says, where I go, you cannot come? And he said to them, you're from beneath, I'm from above. You're of the world, I'm not of this world. I said therefore to you that you shall die in your sins. If you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. And they said to him, who are you? And Jesus said to them, even the same I've been saying to you from the very beginning. Jesus tells them there's going to, time, there's going to be a time to come. You'll cry out and it will be too late. You will not find me. You will be paying for your sins in hell. You will want forgiveness but not find it. What agony to think right now in hell. There are people crying out to the true Christ, but the door has been shut. The opportunity is lost. Turn with me to Luke 16, 19. One last story as we close out. Luke 16, 19. I mean, we've looked at the story of John 7 with Jesus and his preaching. We've looked at the foolish virgins. Now let's some could go to other passages, but let's look at this last one. As we approach the communion table this morning, the rich man, verse 19, who was dressed in purple and fine linen, he feasted sumptuously every day. But at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, whose body was covered with sores, who longed to eat what fell from the rich man's table. In addition, the dogs came and licked his sores. Now the poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. And the rich man also died and was buried and in hell. No gap. In hell he was in torment. He looked up and saw Abraham afar off with Lazarus at his side and he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. This is the calling, the seeking that Jesus is describing. And send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue because I am in anguish in this fire. But Abraham said, child, watch this, remember, what have you got in hell? A memory. Child, remember that in your lifetime you receive your good things. People in hell know all of the good opportunities that they would have been given, included the good things that the Lord gave them from his benevolent hand and Lazarus likewise the bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. Besides all this, there is a great chasm which has been fixed between us so that those who want to, watch everyone, who want to, who want to cross over from here, cannot do so. No one can cross from there to us. No one. So the rich man said, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my house. For I have five brothers. I've got family. I don't want them to come here. Warn them so that they do not come into this place of torment. But Abraham said they have Moses and the prophets. They must respond to them. What is he saying? They've got the Bible. They've got the scriptures. They must believe the scripture. The rich man said, no, Father Abraham. But if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He replied to them, if they do not respond to the Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if somebody comes or raises from the dead. Can we see it here, friends? It was too late for the rich man. It was too late. He had his opportunity in his life and when he died, it was too late. He was seeking for Christ but could not be saved. Well, let's distribute the emblems this morning. and In this frame of mind, let us soberly approach the table.